Good morning, your brothers and sisters in Christ. Welcome to our weekly chat. This week, it is not live. I'm actually making a video that we will show today. Our topic this morning, I wanted to take a tour of, of an Orthodox church, specifically our St. Sabbath church here in McKeesport, but just to give you a sense of uh, the design and plan of Orthodox architecture and how it really impacts on our personal faith. So I'm gonna switch the camera around so we can begin our, our, our journey. And um, unfortunately, you can't leave any comments or questions. You can do so at the end when the video is over, but uh, our love and prayers, and we'll be uh, talking with you soon, God willing. So this is the St. Saba Serbian Orthodox Church in McKeesport, Pennsylvania. And if I can just start, in the long history of the Orthodox Church, there was a definite style of church architecture that developed. The style is characterized by the attempt to reveal the fundamental experience of Orthodox Christianity in total, which is God is with us. The fact that Christ the Emmanuel has, be, has come determines the form of the Orthodox Church buildings. God is with man in Christ through the Holy Spirit. As St. Paul said in 2 Corinthians, we are the temple of the living God. And it's exactly this conviction and experience that Orthodox Church architecture wishes to convey. The architecture in the Orthodox Church reveals that God is with men dwelling in them and living in them through Christ and the Spirit. It does so by using the dome or the vaulted ceiling to crown the Christian church building, the house of the church, which is the people of God. Unlike the pointed archers, which point to God far up in the heavens, the dome or the spacious, all-embracing ceiling gives the impression that in the kingdom of God and in the church, Christ dwells and he unites all things to himself, things in heaven and on earth. The interior of the Orthodox Church building is particularly styled to give the experience of the unity of all things in God. It is not constructed to reproduce the upper room of the Last Supper, nor to be simply a meeting hall for men whose life exists solely within the bounds of this earth. The church building, in fact, is patterned after the image of God's kingdom in the book of Revelation. Before us is the altar table on which Christ is enthroned, and we'll see that when we go into the altar specifically. Both, and Christ is enthroned both as the Word of God in the Gospels, as the Lamb of God in the Eucharistic sacrifice. Around the tables, are the angels and saints. The servants of the word and the lamb who glorify him and through him God the Father is inspired by the Holy Spirit. The faithful Christians on earth who already belong to the Holy Assembly, as it says in Ephesians, the fellow citizens with the saints and members of the household of God enter into the eternal worship of God's kingdom in the church. Thus, in Orthodox practice, the vestibule symbolizes the word. And let me show you, when they make reference to the vestibule, what they're talking about. In our church, it's rather um, unique because the vestibule is actually a short downstairs. The original design of this church back in 1950, um, this was going to be the, the entrance to the church, and here was the vestibule where they would uh, obviously have their candles, whatever, set up. It turns out that once they uh, developed the construction of the, the parking area, whatever, they decided that the 
entrance of the church would be out here. And this back part of the nave would be the vestibule. But really the vestibule is, as I showed you downstairs, this whole area of the church where the pews are, is considered the nave of the church. And it's the place of the church understood as the assembly of the people of God. The altar area called the sanctuary or the holy place stands for the kingdom of God. We've already mentioned that the entire church building is centered around the altar table. The altar table does not merely symbolize the table of the Last Supper. It is symbolic of the mystical presence of the heavenly throne and the table of the kingdom of God. The table of Christ the Word, the Lamb and the King of God, which is glorified dominion over all of creation. The book of the Gospels is perpetually enthroned on the altar table. It's also on the altar table that we offer the blood of sacrifice of Christ to the Father. And from the altar table we receive the bread of life, the body and blood of the Lord's Passover supper. This table is the table of God's kingdom. In Orthodox tradition, the altar table is often carved in wood or stone. Here in, in, in our St. Salvador Church in McKeesport, it's, also, it's obviously stone. It's usually vested with colorful material to show its divine and heavenly character. It should always be a simple table of proportional dimensions, often a perfect cube, and is always freestanding, so that it might be encircled. And you can see, of course, that you're able to walk around the entire altar table. On the altar table, one always finds the antimens or antimensia. The antimens. is a cloth depicting Christ in the tomb, which contains the signature of the diocesan bishop, and is the permission for the local community to gather as the church. Here I'm opening the antimens and I'll show you. So that's the antimens, Christ entombed, and there is, uh, his Grace, our Father Bishop Eden's signature. The word antimensions means literally instead of the table. And since the bishop is the proper pastor of the church, the antimens is usually is used instead of the bishop's own table, which is obviously in his own church building, the cathedral, where the bishop has his chair, his throne, or cathedra. The antimens usually contains a relic, normally a part of the body of a saint which shows that the church is built on the blood of the martyrs and the lives of God's holy people. And I'm putting my fingers over the, where the relic is. Um, there's a little pouch there and you can kind of see a little circle there. That's where the relic is. This custom comes from the early church practice of gathering and celebrating the Eucharist on the graves of those who have lived and died for the Christian faith. Usually a relic of a saint is embedded in the altar table as well, and that's true. Also on the altar table, there is a tabernacle, often in the shape of a church building, which is a repository for the gifts of Holy Communion that are reserved for the sick and the dying. Behind the altar table, there is usually a seven-branched candle. On our altar, we have actually two of them. And it comes from the Old Testament tradition of the Jewish temple. Generally speaking, the Jerusalem temple is highly value, valued in the Orthodox Christian tradition of worship. And the church construction as a prototype of the true worship in spirit and in truth. Also found on the altar table is a small hand cross. Here I actually have two. For the blessing and for veneration of the faithful. The sign of the cross is used throughout the church building on the holy vessels, stands, tables, and vestments. The cross, of course, is a central symbol for Christians, not only as the instrument of the world's salvation by the crucified Christ, 
but also as the constant witness to the fact that men cannot be Christian unless they live with the cross as the very content of their lives in this world. For these reasons, Christians place upon themselves the sign of the cross. And we know that with the two fingers and the thumb together to form a sign of the triune God and cross themselves from the head to the breast and from shoulder to shoulder, from right to left. The unique and all-embracing symbol shows that the cross is the inspiration, the power, and indeed the very content of our lives as Christians. And that man's mind, heart, and strength must be given to the love of God and man. As we face the altar area, area the table of oblation on which the bread and wine prepared for the liturgy stands on the left side of the altar table. Let me uncover the gifts here. The chalice, the cup for the wine, and the discourse, the round plate, elevated on the stand for the bread, are kept on this table. These vessels are normally de decorated with icono icono iconographic engravings, Christian symbols, and the sign of the cross. On the table, there is also a spear for cutting the bread, a spoon for ministering Holy Communion to the people, and there's a a cruci cruciform piece of metal called the star, which holds the covers over the Eucharistic bread on the discos. I can show you those right, right now. There's the spear, and there's the spoon, and here's the cross, or it's called, as it's called, the star. Okay. Above the table of oblation, which stands in the altar area to the left of the altar table, one might find various icons. A favorite one is that of Christ praying in the, in the Gethsemane. Now there's that in the Nativity. In our case, we have a picture of, of Christ on the cross, signifying his, his, his wonderful sacrifice on our behalf. In the Orthodox Church, the icons bear witness to the reality of God's presence with us and the mystery of faith. The icons are not just human pictures or visual aids to contemplate and to, and to pray. They are also the witnesses of the presence of the kingdom of God to us, and so are of our own presence in the kingdom of God in the church. It is the orthodox faith that icons are not only permissible, but are spiritually necessary, because the word became flesh and dwelt among us. The iconostas, well, the icon screen in the Orthodox Church exists to show our unity with Christ, his mother, and all the angels and saints. It exists to show our unity with God. The altar table, which stands for the banquet table of the kingdom of God, is placed behind the so-called royal doors, between the icons of the Theotokos and child, and also the glorified Christ showing that everything that which happens to us in the church happens in history between these two comings of Christ, between his coming as the Savior born of Mary and his coming again at the end of the age as the King and the Judge. The icons on the royal doors witness to the presence of Christ's good news, the gospel of salvation. The four evangelists, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, who record the gospels appear and all fall. Forgive me, we reached our capacity. I had to delete some things so we can continue our video. So the icon uh, on, the, on the royal doors also is of the Annunciation, the Archangel Gabriel appearing to the Mother of God to announce that she will uh, give birth to the Christ child. Over the doors we have the icon of Christ Mystical Supper, the icon of the central mystery of the Christian faith and the unity of the church and the world. It is the visual witness that we too are partakers in the marriage supper of the Lamb. And that we too are blessed by Christ. 
to eat and drink at his table in his kingdom. Over and around the central gates are the icons of the saints. Christ, John the Forerunner, St. Demetrius, and St. Tikon. And then over here we have, of course, Theotokos and Christ Child, our patron St. Sava, St. Nicholas the Wonder Worker, and the prophet Elijah. I have my deacon doors open to allow cool air into the altar, but the deacon doors have icons depicting deacons or angels, God's servants. And you should know that in the early centuries of the church, the iconostas was very simple. It was probably a rail that allowed people to partake of the entire uh, moment of the, of, of the divine liturgy. Over the centuries, though, the development has become very ornate. You can see iconostasas in, in Russia and Serbia that literally go from the floor all the way up to the ceiling. In our case, the original iconostas is the one that you see at the lower level. It was built in 1901. The second higher level was added when the church was constructed here on Hartman Street in 1950. Directly behind the altar, there is usually an image of Christ in glory, enthroned or transfigured. And this is what we have here. Okay. And then throughout the church, you see, again, icons. Icon windows that we have the Theotokos, protection of the Theotokos, St. Nikolai of Jicha, who is a bishop in Eastern America, Saints Cosmos and Damien. I should probably move back so you can see them better. Physician brothers in the early church. Again, St. Nicholas of Myra and Lycia, very popular saint in our parish. Saint Petka of Serbia, Saint Lazar, Prince of Serbia, who fought the famous Battle of Kosovo in 1389, father and son Saint Simeon and Saint Sava, and of course. St. George the Great Martyr, a very popular Orthodox saint. So in the Orthodox Church, again, what we see is the collection of both the triumphant church, the church of God's kingdom in heaven, and the militant church, the church of God's people here on earth, still working out through God's grace their salvation. So that's going to do it for today. Uh, I will do my best to try to upload all of this uh, for our, our show. And I'll try to obviously get some help from my, my wonderful technicians here in our parish. We love you. We ask your prayers. We always pray for you because in doing that, we are truly united in Christ.